Today's scripture reading is Psalm 30. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I am silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. This is God's word. Amen. Church, let's pray. God, we thank you and we praise you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the Psalms that give us Lord, an echo of the emotions that we feel and direction in how to bring them into your presence with honesty, but also with hope. I pray, Lord, that as we look at your word, we would see your love for us, your goodness and grace, and that you would help us, Lord, to, to live with thankfulness and joy, to live with hope, knowing that your grace is new every morning. Lord, I pray that your gospel would be clear to your people, despite the shortcomings of the one who brings the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we all like a reversal, don't we? Excuse me. We all like stories where someone successful experiences a tragedy and then makes an unexpected comeback. Perhaps they fail, perhaps they fall short, perhaps they get really arrogant and fall flat on their face. The question is, what are they going to do? What's going to happen next? Are they going to come back? That's like what the story of Rocky is, all of the movies, right? Um, it's what those little vignettes or personal stories during the Olympics are all about. And I love those. I, I love watching the Olympics. This has been a wonderful year for the Olympics. Um, just a lot of joy and a lot of uh, celebration by athletes. A lot of mutual encouragement. It's been encouraging to see. But there's this one story that stuck with me, the story of an American gymnast um, who wins a gold medal three years ago only to suffer with a terrible kidney disorder that nearly knocks her out of the sport to the point where six months ago people couldn't have imagined her competing. But then she makes an unexpected comeback and wins a medal again this year and helps her team to win the team gold. It's just a beautiful story. When situations turn around, when tragedy turns to triumph, when failures teach their lessons, and the ones who learn, who, who fail, learn humility and come back stronger, we all rejoice. We're all inspired. I love these stories. It's hard not to. In a way, though, that's what the Psalms of Thanksgiving celebrate. They are stories of a great reversal, a complete change around, a turning of sorrow and sackcloth into dancing and rejoicing. But instead of celebrating passing human achievement, that's not ultimate, not eternal, they celebrate God's restoring mercy. They celebrate God's mercy when he brings us from the depths to walk on the heights, to use the, a quote from one of those Puritan prayers in the Valley of Vision. In our series on the Psalms, we've looked at two of the three main types of Psalms. If you were here several weeks ago when we started this, we looked at hymns of praise and we looked at laments um, three weeks ago. Now today we're looking at the third main category, Psalms of Thanksgiving. 
Uh, now, Psalms of Thanksgiving, like Psalm 30 that uh, was read for us this morning, they tell us that we need to take time to say thank you when we experience God's goodness. Notice what I said there, though. It's that we need to take time to say thank you, to recognize what God has done. God doesn't need it. Now, it's not because God is going to feel offended if we don't like, um, if, if, if we... Um, if we're someone who, who like gets offended when they don't get a thank you note, that's not how God is when, when he doesn't get thanks from us. But it's because we need to remember, we need to celebrate and to share God's goodness. It's essential to our growth. It's essential to Christian maturity. It's essential to Christian community and to our gospel witness. It's so that we and those with whom we share our joy We'll learn to trust him more when the, when the other shoe drops later. And that really is my message for you today as we open up Psalm 30 and explore this wonderful celebration. It's that the whole family of God is strengthened both in joy and in mission when we take time to reflect on and thank God for his goodness and his deliverance in our personal life stories. When we take time to say thank you, we build up not only ourselves, but the church and the church in its mission. Now, the main difference between psalms of thanksgiving, like Psalm 30, and hymns of praise um, is that where the latter, what we looked at several weeks ago, looks at the big picture. It says, God, you're amazing. You made everything. Everything is alive. The fish in the sea are, are jumping for joy. Like, it's celebrating God's acts of creation and his acts of restoration. There are hymns of praise that celebrate uh, God's people being freed from slavery in Egypt. And there are hymns of praise that celebrate his creative work. Uh, big acts of deliverance for hymns of praise. Psalms of Thanksgiving, on the other hand, they're all about God's intervention in my life. In your life. They're extremely personal and they're often very, very specific. Psalm 30 is one of those that's rather general, but they're often very specific and they're very personal. They cry out saying, come and see what the Lord has done for me. Big picture versus personal. They're about God entering my story and bringing hope and wholeness where there was only hopelessness before. But in this way, the Psalms of Thanksgiving are also related to our laments that we looked at a few weeks ago. They're really celebrating God answering the prayers we utter in the times of lament. In fact, one thing about the Psalms you may not realize is that they're organized for a purpose. They're not just a grab bag. Um, they're intentionally arranged. Psalm 30 itself is actually connected to Psalm 29, a royal psalm, and Psalm 28, a lament. Psalm 30 is the great reversal that is being longed for in Psalm 28, that lament, and it serves as its fullest conclusion. Looking at the first three verses of Psalm 30, we find David, the psalmist, sharing his personal story of God's intervention. And he actually does it twice in this psalm. First in verses 1 through 3, and then again in 6 through 10 with a bit more detail. Regardless, we don't specifically know what event he's referring to. It could be many different ones. In any event, it was a dark time in David's life. He says, I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. It's a wonderful image of the ocean's dark deeps. You know, so often we look at the Psalms, and, and perhaps if you're new to reading Scripture, you might read the Psalms the same way you read uh, the letters of Paul in the New Testament. The letters of Paul seem to be written with mathematical precision, every word loaded with meaning. But if we do that, and we treat the Psalms the same way, we miss how compelling these images are. You've got you to read the Psalms with your eyes open and then close your eyes and let it stew for a little while. Picture yourself in the ocean's depths, looking up towards a light that you can barely see. That's what David's describing here. He says, you did not let my enemies gloat over me. It's not that he was necessarily being attacked by people, but, but that enemies would come in and see, hey, the king is weak. We want to crush him and take his throne. And there are many times in David's life where you could see that exact situation playing out, or almost playing out. 
The next verse, it has a parallel image. It says, you brought me up from the realm of the dead. You can see how this is applied to Jesus as well. Though David's not talking about being actually dead. It's kind of like what the, the, uh, the guy, Miracle Max in Princess Bride says. He's only mostly dead. Um, David was only mostly dead. Um, he could be brought back by that, by that miracle pill from Miracle Max. But no, God brought him back. He then says, you spared me from going down to the pit which is a picture of the realm of the dead. You protected me. You can hear lament in this psalm, can't you? You can hear him looking back to that time of darkness and remembering how terrible it was. But unlike a lament, it's all in the past tense. It's not in the present tense. He's remembering his former agony, an agony he again and con- again compares with death and darkness. But at this point in David's life story, the story has come full circle, and he's seen God's reversal of his circumstances. He's been restored. Look at the verbs that David uses to speak of God's action. You, Lord, lifted me. You healed me. Literally, the word there is mended or stitched me back together like I had gone to pieces and you carefully sewed me back up the way I was supposed to be. You brought me up. You spared me. He is celebrating God's grace. David felt as though he went from death to life, from going down to being lifted up, from going to pieces to being put back together. What's interesting, though, is the cause of David's calamity. And what God was doing in the middle of the story when everything seemed dark. You know, that's often our question, isn't it? Why we experience the difficulties we do. Why we experience the challenges we face. And where is God in the midst of our laments? Sometimes you can see him at work before and at work after. But in the mess, it's hard to see. It's another reason we need these psalms. In verses 6 through 7, David says, When I felt secure, I said, I'll never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. Now, what's going on there? We can read that and get a little bit confused. Because it almost seems like God's being capricious. Or he's, he's turning his face away from David at a whim, just to prove a point taking this innocent guy who feels secure and shaking him up just for the heck of it. But that's not the case at all, even though you can feel that way. What David's actually telling us is that the cause of his calamity was his own hubris, his own arrogance, trusting in his own strength. He's saying, I, when, I said, when I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. But notice what he says right after. He says right after, no, but I was wrong. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. It's like in the moment he thought his strength and his power was his own, that he had built the kingdom of his own strength. But after the calamity, he looks back and says, but you know what? I was wrong. I didn't see it. I didn't understand that what I thought I had built was built by you. It was an act of your grace. You were the one who made my royal mountain stand firm. Have any of you been in that place before? A place of utter self-confidence and trust in your own flesh. I've talked with friends who've been fired from jobs, who've, who've had those experiences where there's been incredible success, and then all of a sudden, it's like everything comes crashing down. And they realize, wow, I thought I was secure, but it was a house of cards. David's telling us that the cause of his calamity was his own arrogance. God had favored him, and he was stable, but he turned away, trusting in self. And God let him feel the consequence. But David says that when I cried for mercy, God relented and showed his grace, as he always does. And he experienced a great reversal. His wailing became dancing. You know, we can think of so many accounts from David's life that fit with this explanation. We've been going through a study of the life of David, of King David, in in our men's ministry Bible study, going through 2 Samuel. It's kind of a conclusion to our 1 Samuel series. 
And we've seen a lot of this, haven't we, men? Um, whether it's his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah, where he's confident in his own strength, he's secure at his own strength, and then he is confronted with his sin, or his failure as a father that led to his son Absalom temporarily usurping the kingdom after he failed to hold his own children accountable. Or it's his decision at the end of his life, um, or near the end of his life, to just take a census of his fighting men against God's command. David often struggled with losing sight of his need to trust and obey the God who set him on the throne. But what made him different, what made David a man after God's own heart, was verse 8 of our psalm today. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I called for mercy. Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. What is different in him than the way of this world? There is a humility, a recognition of shortcoming. It's like the confession that we make every week we celebrate the Lord's table. We confess our sins and our shortcomings our overconfidence, and our trust in self. And we are reminded to trust in the Lord for the strength that he gives at this table, which represents his gospel sacrifice for us. And then what happens when he turns, when he learns to trust again? It's then he experienced that, Lord, you turned my wailing into dancing, you removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. You see... What David says, when, when he talks about God turning your face from me and being dismayed, God didn't actually turn his face from David. He never stopped favoring him. In fact, in that situation, the difficulty he experienced was actually God's favor. God was always there. You know, laments often express the feeling of God's distance and lack of care, and they tell us that it is okay to express that. It is not unchristian or lacking faith to say, God, where are you? Don't let anyone tell you that. You can be honest with your burdens before the Lord, but the songs of thanksgiving tell us, even though we feel that way, God never leaves his own. He never did. And one day you're going to see it if you're in that place of lament and sorrow. The Psalms of Thanksgiving let us put on glasses that give us 20-20 vision on our suffering. Seeing that God was never distant at all, he was always present and faithful. David's gratitude is not for God changing his disposition towards David. No, he is grateful for the restorative mercy of God. He's grateful that he has come back from his misplaced sense of security to trust fully in the Lord. You know, when you and I experience God's mercy in small ways and in big ones, when we see glimpses of our story in Psalm 30, it is so important for us to remember it. You know, I am a super inconsistent journal, journaler. Any of you keep, like, journals and diaries and you're utterly faithful with it? Go ahead and you can raise your hand. You can own up to it. It's a really good thing. Nobody? Really? I think you're just being... I, I, saw, I saw a hand. Okay. And I think there are more of you. You just tend to be very thoughtful and not want to draw attention to yourself. And you're like, I don't want anybody reading that, so I'm not going to let them know it's, it's there. Anyway, I'm super inconsistent. Um, there was a time in college I was, a little, I was religious about it, um, and then it's been pretty much hit or miss since then, and that's a long time ago. But as I look back at the times I journaled most frequently, I found that they were times of significant uh, or stressful change in my life. Uh, perhaps that's like you. Big life moments, like when, in the lead up to me asking Laura to marry me. Lots of journal entries, lots of thoughts. Um, job or career changes. I've done a few of those in my life now, and there are journal entries going along with them. Um, when I became reformed in my understanding of Scripture and kind of had a rebirth or reawakening of faith, man, the ink just flowed. It flowed a ton. Um, I also journal in times of sorrow, grief, or failure. When I've fallen short or experienced suffering and I don't know how to think through it, 
and I need to write down my thoughts to process it. The times I don't journal as often is after these times of transition or suffering. Um, it's after God has provided that the ink stops for me. If my journals were like, were like the Psalms, there would be no songs of thanksgiving written down. I'd be missing a third of the book. It's as though I'm content to move on, to say thank you and then enjoy the blessing. My attention moves on quickly once the crisis is passed. You know, I don't know what your story looks like or how God has met you in your darkness and brought you through, but I've learned that failing to reflect on it, it isn't healthy. It actually stunts spiritual growth and future resilience. It robs us of the ability to grow from our moments of sorrow and failure. We need to remember what God has done, even if it's small, and especially when it's big. We need to take time to say thank you that we might grow and learn better to trust in the Lord the next time we feel we've been thrown into the depths and can't catch a breath, because it's going to happen. It will happen. Suffering comes around. That's actually why these psalms of thanksgiving are so common. But you know, this act of remembering or thanking God, it's not merely for your benefit. It's not just for you. It's for everyone. And it's for the world outside. There's a word repeated in this psalm three times. It's this word praise. It's the verb praise. We see it in verse 4, verse 9, and verse 12. It's the Hebrew word um, hodah. And it literally means to give thanks or confess gratitude. My Old Testament professor, Mark Futado, said that uh, where English-speaking mothers tell their children, vary your grammar so people don't get bored with your writing. you got to be creative and use a whole bunch of different verbs to mean the same thing. Hebrew mothers actually told their children, repeat your grammar so people don't forget. It was the entire opposite thing. So when you see words repeated in the Psalms again and again and again, it's to tell you, Stop, listen, I'm saying something really important that you need to get. And here it's this word praise or give thanks. In fact, uh, the word hodah is the main theme of the Psalms of Thanksgiving. David says, I will praise you, Lord, I will give thanks. He says, how could I give you thanks if I was dead? But then he says to the people in verse 4, the audience of his Psalm of Thanksgiving, now you... Give thanks with me. You give thanks with me. That is one of the other consistent parts of the Psalms of Thanksgiving. They are never just me and God prayers to God. They are, the, the, the context for it is never just me in a private moment with the Lord. Um, it's never just us looking in on David's prayer life with God. There is an invitation and even a command for us to celebrate God's goodness with David. You know, I love this, and I think if there's anything, any practice you need to take away from this passage, it's right here. It's right here. Our experiences of God's goodness, they are not just for us. They're not just for you. They're not just for your close family. They're for all God's people and for the world that needs to see the goodness of God because it strengthens the community in faith. You know, the Psalms of Thanksgiving, they were often used in the worship of God's people. And they're particularly associated with an Old Testament command to make a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. You know, if you've read your Old Testament at all, you, you can run into the section in Leviticus and, um, where there's a whole bunch of sacrifices and ceremonies prescribed. And you can get really confused saying, one, I don't see people doing this today. And two, what in the world? All of these animals, all of this blood in the temple, it was kind of messy. What is going on there? Well, I'm not going to explain all of it except for this one, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. It was a sacrifice to be made when anyone experienced God restoring his fortunes, when they experienced a great reversal described by the Psalms of thanksgiving. Um, what's interesting about this command in the book of Leviticus is uh, to make a sacrifice of thanksgiving is that the whole community is to share the benefit of it. The one giving thanks would sacrifice a large animal and then every bit of it had to be eaten before the end of the day. Isn't that cool? It's kind of like a potluck dinner. You knew I was going to get a potluck dinner reference in there, if you know me. The one giving thanks would, 
would make this incredible show of gratitude to God, and then the whole community had to eat it in order for it to be a valid sacrifice. It took the whole community to celebrate and to make a toda. You can hear the relationship between that noun for a sacrifice of thanksgiving and the word hoda, which is to give thanks. It took the whole community to thank God. You actually see descriptions of this in Psalm 22. It says, I will praise you among all the people. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will rejoice with an everlasting joy. You see what it says there. When I thank God, the poor eat and are satisfied. It is a meal that brings together all of God's people from all walks of life. And all are satisfied with the demonstration of a thankful heart. When one person is blessed, the whole community gives thanks and the poor get to eat. Now, why is this important? It's because our stories, our experiences of God's goodness in the land of the living, to reference Psalm 27, again, they are never just for us. We have to share them. We have to bear witness to testify to God's grace. Not only do I need to remember to give thanks, but I'm actually depriving the community. You're depriving your neighbor sitting in the pew next to you if you don't give thanks when you experience God's goodness and share that with one another. You're depriving your community of joy and growth when you keep your mouth shut. That's what verses 4 and 5 are all about in our passage. David, I see the scene, he's making a sacrifice of thanksgiving in the great assembly of God's people, and he turns around, as it were, to the gathered assembly of God's people before they eat the wonderful meal, which I'm sure was great and exuberant because he's the king and he's got a lot of animals. And he instructs them, people, sing the praises of God, you his faithful people. Give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, but his favor, it lasts a lifetime. Look, Come see what the Lord has done for me. His favor lasts. My weeping, it lasts for a night, and yours will too. But joy always comes in the morning. And they all eat, and they celebrate, and they remember. You know, we, always, we see this all the time in the church. I'm reticent a little bit to share this story because I don't want anyone to feel an obligation to do this, but... I just loved it when it happened, so I'm going to share it anyway, and um, you do with it what you will. A couple of years ago, we had a baptism, and after the baptism, the family threw a huge feast over in the fellowship hall. It was awesome. It was a lot like this sacrifice of Thanksgiving, celebrating God's covenant with those children. An invitation to come and see what the Lord had done that we all might share in the blessing. And I, if you were there, you were encouraged by it. It was a feast of rich food reminding us of the joy of children being in relationship with the Lord. You know, we think it's Christian modesty to keep quiet about God's goodness to us, but the Psalms of Thanksgiving cry out, how can I keep from singing and shouting your praise? I've got to share it. When God has been good, don't deny poor and thirsty souls their meal of joy. You know, for me, the greatest display in Scripture of what a life singing the Psalms of Thanksgiving produces, it came the morning, the third day after Jesus was crucified on the cross. In the Gospel of Luke, we read that women who were Jesus' disciples, they came to the tomb to anoint his body and saw the stone which sealed the tomb rolled away and there was no body to be found. There they encountered an angel who gave them the good news of Jesus' resurrection he said, why do you look for the living among the dead? And then what do they do? Great reversal. They're despairing. They're sorrowful. They're about to anoint a dead body. And they find out he's alive. What do they do? Do they keep that to themselves? Do they just sit there and marvel at what God had done? Uh, this remarkable reversal thinking, ooh, this is a message just for me. This is just about me. Is that what they do? No. 
This amazing grace of their Savior, breaking the power of sin and death forever, bearing the cost of their sin, rising to give them life. Do they go on their merry way thinking the news was just for them? No. How could they? How could they keep silent? They were overwhelmed with thankfulness. So they went and they shared the good news. They made their confession. Come and see what the Lord has done for me. Now, the disciples, they struggled a little with believing the testimony of women, so they had to go back and find out for themselves. But that's beside the point. They made a faithful profession, and the first witnesses of the resurrection were those women. You know, that's why thankfulness, the songs of thanksgiving, they are not merely for us, not merely for the community, but for the world at large. They are fuel for the church's mission among people who need to see the goodness of God. Because we are called to be agents of blessing. That is the fundamental mission of the church. And because the songs of thanksgiving are connected with the sacrifice of thanksgiving, we not only share good news, but we display it in generosity, like that generous thanksgiving feast. We display it in generous mercy and service to a world in need. In word and deed, making sure that even those who are far off from the Lord have an invitation to come and celebrate his goodness. In doing so, our songs of thanksgiving, they become the means by which God blesses the world through his covenant people, the church. Church, if we don't learn to say thank you, to remember God's goodness, and become saturated with that call to give thanks, which we hear three times in this psalm, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, If that isn't running through our veins, how will we be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ, of his reconciling work on the cross with a world that needs it? We need to practice celebrating the goodness of God in our lives, that the habit of thanksgiving would overflow in a life confessing our gratitude to the Lord in the presence of one another in the world. It is the way we will stand through life's turmoil. It is the way we will care for and serve one another as we share his goodness. And it is how the world will see in our generous and irrational joy the truth of a God who enters our messy stories, who does not turn away his face even in the darkness, but brings permanent everlasting hope and life to those who trust in him. The morning always comes for God's people. It always does. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Never forget that. The resurrection happened in the past. And you are saturated with his resurrection life. And have the sure promise, if you have trusted in Christ, of eternal life with him because Jesus rose. The morning always comes. Jesus Christ is risen. Amen. Amen. You know, living with this perspective can change even the grumpiest curmudgeon. And there are some of you out there, you know who you are. Into someone who, like David, dances in the streets with undignified joy. I love that scene. It's why the church historically has been the place where generosity explodes during times of loss and suffering. Because we know the morning has come in Christ and is coming for us. No matter how long the night may be, even if it takes us to our grave, there is still the resurrection morning. You know, I want to wrap up with a transition to the Lord's table. Because it is so fitting that we celebrate this meal when we're looking at a psalm of thanksgiving. Because it is a meal of thanksgiving. A banquet of rich food saturated with the grace of Christ Jesus. It is a meal of thanksgiving in which our Lord himself invites us to eat and be satisfied, to celebrate with him. Though Jesus celebrated that last supper with uh, somberness, as a somber affair before going and suffering uh, to his suffering and death, he also said it pointed forward to a future meal that he would eat with his people in joy. As we come to the table, it is for us a meal of thanksgiving in which we are called to come, taste, and see the Lord's goodness to us. And we eat it with each other, with our eyes open, knowing our neighbors, 
that in the eating and drinking we might bear witness to one another that Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, God has been good to me. He took my sin, gave me his righteousness, took my rags of sackcloth and gave me joy. He turned my lament into dancing. We called for help and he knit us back together to himself and each other in love. Church, sing his praises, you faithful people. Praise his holy name. His anger lasts but for a moment, but his favor shown in Christ Jesus, it lasts for a lifetime. Your weeping lasts for the night, but joy, lasting and eternal joy, came that resurrection morning. There is always mourning for God's people. Come give thanks. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see what the Lord has done for you and me. Amen. God, we thank you and praise you for all that you have done for us. Lord, some of us come with hearts full of lament and grief. Some feel far off. Some are burdened by a weight of sin and failure. Lord, help us to come into your presence, even now to this table with thanksgiving, knowing that you have done in Christ everything necessary to redeem not only our souls, but our bodies and this broken and shattered world that you by the cross and the empty tomb have made all things new. Help us, Lord, to trust in that resurrection morning. Know that is for us and celebrate with joy, joy that each other grow from and joy that this world sees and wonders at, that all might praise and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen.